My name is Shauna Sylvester and I am the Executive Director of Carbon Talks and I'd like to welcome you here this afternoon on behalf of Carbon Talks, Simon Fraser University Centre for Dialogue and I want to acknowledge our partners in hosting each of our lunchtime dialogues. The North Growth Foundation and it's wonderful to have you with us today Rudy. The North Growth Foundation and the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions. They are our partners in each of the Carbon Talks that we host. I also want to welcome those of you that are following us through webcast. Um, I hope that you will tweet in your questions so that when it comes time for the Q&A we get a chance to hear from you as well. I'm excited today. We have three fantastic speakers to look at an issue that I don't think, and, and Tom knows this, each time we talk about LNG the question about the business case comes up and I don't think we've heard enough um, from the proponents of LNG on the business case. And I al we've also invited Catherine because we also, as Carbon Talks, the whole issue of where this fits into climate change and our, cli and our carbon targets also comes to bear. So we want to look at this within the broader uh, context of, of carbon issues and, and GHG emission reductions. Uh, many have heard LNG talked about <coughs> as a transitional fuel and that's going to be one of the, the ideas that we'll explore as well today. If you haven't, how many of you have been to a Carbon Talks before? Just put up your hand. So you know, you know the process. We get to hear from our speakers. We keep our speakers pretty tight in terms of how much time people have to speak so that we can really make this more of a dialogue. So there'll be a chance. Everyone's going to have eight to ten minutes and then uh, we're going to open it up to a Q&A. So uh, please get your questions ready. And if we don't have a chance to answer and get to all of the questions, then what we'll do is, is we'll uh, post those to our, our Twitter feed and, and see if others will join in that conversation. We have a hashtag, and that is hashtag BCLNG. And then if you put it at Carbon Talks, that will also um, engage our community as well. So let me begin. Jeff, you're first. Jeff Morrison is the manager of British Columbia's operations for the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. In his role, Jeff facilitates and promotes constructive relationships with government, regulators, and stakeholders to enhance the economic sustainability of the Canadian upstream petroleum industry in a safe, environmentally, and socially responsible manner. Jeff has returned to CAP after working in public affairs for 11 years in senior roles with a number of prominent communications and public affairs firms. Jeff holds a master's degree and under, undergraduate degree in economics from McGill University, where he studied environmental economics and industrial organization. Jeff sits on the board of the Science and Community <coughs> Environmental Knowledge Fund, which serves to enable relevant applied environmental and wildlife research related to oil and glass, gas exploration and development in BC. He lives in Victoria with his family, where he's a volunteer with a local youth group. Welcome, Jeff, and we'll get you started with you. Uh, thank you very much, and that's, uh, it's always difficult to hear uh, your own bio. Um, anyway, I want to say uh, thank you for inviting me, first of all, and uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I don't have a few minutes, so I'll skip right into my presentation. And um, That didn't work. I'll skip that one. Quick uh, advertising about CAP. Uh, for those who don't know, CAP is the Canadian. Oops, sorry about that. CAP is Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. Uh, kind of covered in my bio. We're all about promoting the upstream oil and gas industry, obviously, uh, but we need to do that in a way that maintains uh, our social license, and part of that, obviously, is the environment and society. I'm going to skip right into what I want to talk about today: is the case for LNG and natural gas, uh, and we represent the upstream industry. I want to talk about the global perspective and the basic premise is that unambiguously natural gas is good for the, uh, for the environment in the context of the global demand for energy. So uh, the International Energy Agency says uh, energy demand is going to increase by 35% uh, by 2035. And so we can ask ourselves what is fundamentally driving that. And so you look at the colored uh, um, wedges of this uh, slide and you might be struck by just how big uh, the oil, gas uh, and coal slices are of that industry and so we have to think about going forward is a low energy economy a possibility and I would argue it is not a possibility uh, and by way of that uh, but is a low emissions uh, a low emissions uh, planet possible 
and possibly it was what I would argue. Uh, and so when you look at this, what's driving this? Well, we look at the Asian economies and we look at what's happening in Asia. Uh, this isn't necessarily being driven by North America, but by those economies that are growing, China, India, uh, Korea, uh, and even, even India, and eventually we'll see uh, Africa coming on in a major way. And so to put this into context, we enjoy quality of life here in North America that is uh, fueled, pardon the pun, by energy and abundant energy and, and affordable energy. If we look out in the future, there are a billion people today that don't have electricity. And so that future, uh, future demand for energy uh, is going to be there. And so as petroleum producers, we say, well, how will we meet that demand? And we would say, well, we will meet it by all sources of, of, of energy. It won't be just be fossil fuels, and it won't be just renewables. We're going to need it all. Uh, but what's the best thing we can do to help meet that demand? And so looking forward, uh, so it's not just the developing worlds, too. There's also a fundamental reality. It does need to be affordable. Uh, and so when alternative fuels are not affordable, those economies won't develop. And it's not just about the developing world. Places like Europe are now substituting away from low environmental em emission fuels and resubstituting coal because natural gas is expensive in Asia, or sorry, in Europe, excuse me. Uh, and so by uh, uh, case in point, uh, Germany has now increased uh, coal uh, electricity production every year since 2009. Uh, but there's a juxtaposition to this, uh, and that's because the relative price. Um, but the juxtaposition of this and the case is this. If we look at the United States and we look at their coal, this is from uh, the Department of Energy in the United States, uh, we'll look at their uh, uh, millions of tons of CO2, and that's not all GHGs, GHGs but it's a, a good uh, precursor. We'll see that there is a bend in that line. And I would argue, and I think it's fundamentally true, that that bend in the line starts to happen just about 2003. Uh, and that's just about the time that we saw uh, natural gas, uh, and particularly uh, uh, shale gas, come on stream in North America. And so we've had a radical redesign or a, a reformation of the market in North America where natural gas was relatively scarce, relatively speaking. Then with the advent of new technology, horizontal drilling, and multiple stage hydraulic fracturing, the price of natural gas fell, and it started to displace coal in the United States. And we actually see that happening right about the same time that shale gas comes on. Uh, we see a very big dip, obviously, in 2009. That's the, uh, the economic, the, the economic uh, crisis, uh, global economic crisis. Uh, but the really interesting stat in all of this, in 2012, the US economy grew by about 2.5%. Uh, and energy demand fell by about 2.5%. And so it's the first time that that's really happened, that decoupling. And that has been brought about by uh, the availability of natural gas. And so as a transition fuel in that world economy where we see a high energy world in the future, how do we achieve lower emissions? And I would argue that LNG and natural gas is the way to go forward. So this looks quickly at uh, LNG has been rapidly uh, expanding uh, for the last uh, uh, several decades. It's tripled in the last three decades. The future for LNG is growing quite a bit. Uh, believe it or not, there is about uh, 30 BCF, billion cubic feet a day of natural gas being traded on LNG tankers today. Uh, <coughs> and BC has an abundant supply of natural gas. Uh, and in addition to that, our traditional markets for natural gas, I'm going to skip forward here. Oop, I'm going to go back one way our traditional markets for natural gas are falling. So the good news about natural gas is it's plentiful and abundant in North America. It is not plentiful and abundant and affordable in the rest of the planet yet. Uh, but the bad news for BC is our traditional markets are disappearing. And so uh, the United States is now importing about 16% uh, less gas today from Canada than they were ten year, uh, five years ago. Uh, and uh, they are actually starting to import natural gas into traditional markets that Western Canada has imported. So LNG is, on a business case, individually fundamentally important market diversification uh, for our industry in Western Canada. So I want to have a quick look at our British Columbia energy port profile. And on the consumption side, I think this may certainly surprise me when I first saw it. Uh, we are considered and we consider ourselves in British Columbia to be a clean economy. And yet a full two-thirds of the energy we consume, and you, this is a, when you compare them all by petajoules, um, two-thirds of the energy we consume right now uh, is fossil fuel based. And so if you think about a jurisdiction like ours that has ready and abundant, uh, abundant supply of natural gas, uh, what can we, and I would argue too as well, uh, we have that 
clean economy in part because of natural gas. And so you, if you flash back 50 or 60 years ago and you looked at Vancouver and said, how do we heat our homes in Vancouver? Uh, we, you'd be surprised that the answer was probably wood, coal, or oil. And 60 years ago, we built a pipeline from northeastern BC to Vancouver, and we bring natural gas here. And so natural gas, while more carbon intensive than hydro, has been part of our economy. And I would argue you couldn't strive to be the cleanest, greenest city in the world if it weren't for that legacy of natural gas. And so natural gas has shown that it can help Vancouver achieve emissions reductions and an aspirational goal. It has demonstrated that in North America, uh, the U.S. has had the lowest GHG emissions in 20 years because of natural gas, and LNG will enable that as a world uh, on a planetary level. And so the argument is simply that uh, if we're going to have a high energy economy, how do we bend the curve to make it less uh, lower um, emissions? Natural gas is a clear, clear, uh, clear way forward in that. So I quickly just want to look at uh, where we uh, consume natural gas. Uh, we only consume about 16% of what we produce. Uh, and I've already made this point, but the U.S., 41% goes to the U.S., 43% goes to the rest of Canada. The U.S. no longer needs our gas or doesn't need as much of it. The rest of Canada doesn't need it as much as we used to. And so as an economy, and I'll get to this point in a minute, um, we need to think about what we can do and what does natural gas industry provide to the economy. This is the business case in part from the government's perspective. So a quick little advertisement here, and this may surprise many people. Uh, on average, uh, the oil and gas industry invests $5 billion a year in the upstream oil and gas industry in British Columbia alone. We employ directly 12,000 people, and forecasting forward, we'll probably employ directly 40,000 people by 2035. It's not a small part of the economy. And so case in point is this is the part of the economy that should LNG come on, could grow further. And so if you look at this from the government's perspective, what does that mean to the people of British Columbia? Uh, it's not the hugest number in the budget, but it's a sizable number. So, so this graph here shows natural gas royalties and land sales. And so for those who don't know, uh, land sales are the right, you, know, you buy the right to ex explore for natural gas and you pay a bonus bid uh, for that. And so we actually see that traditionally, natural gas has provided somewhere between 4 and 6% of the revenues to government, which again is not a big deal, uh, but uh, which part of, which 4 to 6% of the government's budget don't you want to live with, given that <coughs> um, three quarters of it is health and, uh, health and education, uh, it's an important aspect. So if you're in the government's uh, seat looking at the world and you look at the tail of that slide, you see that it's slipping off, and slipping off dramatically. And that is fundamentally because of um, the abundance of natural gas in North America. And so our traditional markets are disappearing. Government's losing a traditional source of revenue. Uh, what can we do to change that? I think I've argued that the, uh, the environmental case is, well, there are more emissions re associated with natural gas than perhaps um, uh, uh, hydro or uh, wind energy, there's certainly less than, 50% less than coal, and there's a world demand for this product. What can we do to help be part of that solution? And so that's where LNG comes in, and that's the business case from the government's perspective is how can we achieve that? I'm out of time? I, I, can, end, I can end it there. Okay, okay. Thank okay. You so much. Thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> I think it's great to have the, uh, the um, slides as well. I'm sure we'll come back to those in the, in the question. Catherine Harrison is a professor of political science at the University of British, British Columbia. She has a bachelor's degree in engineering from the University of Western Ontario, master's degrees in political science and chemical engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and a PhD in political science from UBC. That's quite a mix. Before entering academia, she worked as a chemical engineer in the oil industry and as a policy analyst for both Environment Canada and the United States Congress. Dr. Harrison is the author of and editor of several volumes, the most recent of which is Global Commons, Domestic Decisions, The Comparative Politics of Climate Change. She's also published widely on climate environmental policies and her awards include the Katie Srivasta Award from UBC Press, Fulbright's Fellowships, and Achillam Research Fellowship. Catherine. Thank you. I'm not an expert on the business case for LNG, um, 
I reckon that as long as it's private money and not taxpayers' money, any risks that are associated with those investments is up to these folks. Um, what does worry me is the potential impacts of BC's um, very aggressive development of an LNG industry for pr public goods, and in particular, climate change. I don't expect the private investors to take um, public goods into account. That's the government's job. And there, I think it's pretty troubling that climate change remains the elephant in the LNG room. At best, it's selectively trotted out as a party animal on occasion, um, rather than being acknowledged for the very large beast that it really is with potential to wreak havoc on both provincial and global greenhouse gas emissions targets. So let's consider first the um, provincial and then the global um, scenario. Within BC, um, natural gas production and export will entail a lot of greenhouse gas emissions from wellhead to tanker. Fracking uh, is more emissions intensive than conventional gas production, most notably, notably because there is um, more leakage of methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas um, during um, during fracking operations. BC also has relatively high levels of CO2 present in one of the shale gas reservoirs that's under consideration. And that CO2 would have to be stripped out um, before the gas would be marketable. If that gas is simply vented to the atmosphere, that's another significant source of greenhouse gases. And finally, it is extremely energy intensive to compress a gas into a liquid. And that's only necessary if we're exporting the gas rather than um, using it within the province. Um, one estimate was that the first three LNG plants, um, at least one of which was quite small, would use 85% as much electricity as all of the households in the province. If you're then talking about four or more LNG plants, each exporting one, ton, uh, one million tons per year, the energy needs could be quite extraordinary. If that comes from hydro, we're gonna need a lot more dams and that energy also, that clean energy, will not be available to substitute for fossil fuels within Canada. Um, if that energy comes from burning a fraction of the gas to run compressors at the LNG plant, that's going to produce a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. So what kind of emissions are we talking about? What scale? It's actually a bit hard to say because, quite remarkably, the provincial government isn't talking about this. At one point, I asked staff in the Climate Ex Action Secretariat for an estimate and was told that um, the first three plants, um, assuming the first two of those were hydropowered, could release as much as 16 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions per year. Uh, obviously, that'll be a lot higher with more plants and if the compressors are run by natural gas. A recent report by Clean Energy Canada concluded that from well to tanker, a standard LNG plant will typically entail about one ton of greenhouse gas emissions per, um, um, per ton of LNG ship but a world-class one, sort of adopting the best practices at each step of the process, could lower that by as much as two-thirds. So with a provincial target of about 40 million tons of LNG per year, that suggests a range between 13 and 40 million additional tons of greenhouse gas emissions per year. That's a pretty big range, but the Climate Action Secretary, its own figures are within that range. To put that into um, perspective, um, those emissions would increase BC's greenhouse gas emissions relative to our 2020 target by between 30 and 100 percent. You don't have to be a climate scientist or a petroleum engineer to realize that a plan to export LNG through multiple plants on BC's coast will make it extremely difficult, if not impossible, to meet our 2020 greenhouse gas commitment. So let's turn to the global scale. There's um, reason to believe that Premier Clark is well aware of the potential impact on BC's greenhouse gas emissions, um, since at one point last year she mused that we might have to revisit our 2020 targets in light of the LNG strategy. However, the Premier justified that on the grounds that BC's LNG emissions are gonna be doing the world a favor. The, the argument that our, our natural gas will substitute for dirtier fuels. And Premier Clark underscored that by stating that this myth that our control or responsibility for climate change stops at our borders is wrong. Now, I hope she will apply the same standards to proposals her government is considering for coal and oil exports. But for now, let's look at LNG. The assumption is that because natural gas burns cleaner than coal, that uh, BC's LNG exports will reduce global emissions. And I think that sounds very good, but there's a number of reasons to question that. First, 
Just how BC's LNG compares to coal or oil depends a lot on those emissions from wellhead to tanker. And there's a lively um, debate going on about frack versus conventional natural gas. I haven't seen any, any data for British Columbia. Um, Though it is my understanding that the province is assuming about a third the emissions rate that the EPA does in developing the provincial inventory. That we absolutely need to get a handle on those emissions before making any claims about whether we're doing the world a favor. Second, and at least important, is the question of whether BC's LNG will in fact substitute for dirtier fuels or whether instead it will substitute for lower greenhouse gas emitting fuels. Um, it's quite possible um, that we will be substituting for more expensive energy sources, which tends to be renewables rather than dirtier ones. It's also my understanding that there are several Chinese states, the ones that tend to have abundant coal resources, that actually ban reliance on natural gas for electricity production. Now, I am not an expert on energy modeling and emissions projections globally, but such experts do exist. And at minimum, we need to hear from them before we claim that BC's LNG is going to be good for the planet. And there's a lot at stake. Uh, 40 million tons of LNG exports may increase BC's emissions by 40 million tons, but they will produce an additional 140 million tons of emissions at the destination when that gas is ultimately burned. So what are we hearing from the provincial government? Instead of an open and informed public debate about policy, we're getting inflated uh, promises, semantics, and backtracking. Case in point, uh, last year the province revised its Clean Energy Act to depart from a commitment to 100% renewable energy production by allowing LNG plants to burn natural gas. And this again was justified on the claim that the increase in emissions in BC will be um, outweighed by reductions elsewhere, but um, I'd still like to see the, the evidence for that. Second case in point, when the natural gas strategy was first announced, there was a commitment that the first two plants would be powered by hydroelectricity, but I'm, I don't know if that commitment still stands and we're not hearing much about it. We're not hearing anything about it anymore. Third case in point, just a couple of weeks ago, the Premier clarified that her government's commitment to produce the cleanest LNG in the world only applied to the LNG plants, not the gas production and pipelines. And Premier Clark justified this on the grounds that it's not LNG until it's liquefied, to which I would respond, it's not LNG unless there's some NG in it. Um, I think it's positively disingenuous and also a significant reversal of an election commitment to focus only on the LNG plants. A final case in point, although the Premier's musings last year suggest that she and I'm sure her ministers are well aware of the challenge that the um, province's LNG strategy will have for BC meeting its um, legally binding 2020 greenhouse gas emissions targets, we're not hearing anything about that. In fact, the environment minister seems unwilling to entertain the possibility that this could present a challenge to um, meeting BC's targets, offering only that these are all hypotheticals and that she's confident that industry will find ways to reduce its emissions. To which I have two responses. First, why is the government so confident in releasing projections of job creation, this massive prosperity fund, an increase to um, the provincial economy of the LNG industry, and not at the same time offering projections for the environmental consequences of an industry being developed on that scale? And second, the minister shouldn't be waiting optimistically for the industry to come up with new ways to reduce its emissions. It's her job to regulate the industry and make sure that they do so. Um, so in conclusion, I'm going to leave the business case for LNG up to these folks. If LNG compete with, can compete without taxpayer subsidies in global markets, that's up to them. My challenge would be for the provincial government to do their job and to have an open discussion with British Columbians about the potential consequences for BC and global greenhouse gas emissions and what the government proposes to do about that. I think British Columbians deserve accountability and evidence in our policy discussions, not slogans and semantics. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Last but certainly not least, Tom Sire. Tom has 15 years of experience in senior leadership roles in the public and private sector, including as a Deputy Chief of Staff for Policy Coordination and Issues Management in the Provincial Government of BC. That was 2002 through 2007. And as the Director of First Nation and Corporate Relations for a successful BC-based renewable energy company. 
Tom played an integral role in the development and rollout of numerous significant provincial policy initiatives and in the private sector was responsible for advancing corporate and First Nations relationships, including successfully negotiating comprehensive agreements for the province's largest wind farm and run of the river projects. Tom has actively participated in numerous policy and communications committees for the Business Council, including the Aboriginal Committee, and that is where actually Tom is now. He's the Vice President of Policy and Communications at the Business Council. Um, Tom has also worked uh, with other business and industry groups, including the Energy Policy Institute of Canada. He holds a Master's of Arts and Bachelor of Business Administration from SFU. Tom. Great to be uh, with my alumni. Um, I think what I'm going to do uh, is, is probably uh, not take Catherine's uh, 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 desire to have the business case laid out, because I actually think the business case from a purely economic and, and market perspective is absolutely overwhelming that LNG is both uh, a viable and important potential, and I say potential, part of the future uh, of, of BC's economy. And it's actually quite important for uh, economic reasons. But I'll, I'll spend just a quick minute on that. I'll talk briefly. Jeff's outlined the fiscal uh, imperative around it. And then I actually do want to spend uh, most of my time uh, taking Catherine on a little bit on, on what the environmental uh, imperative around LNG is, because I think uh, there's a pretty compelling case, and I hope to lay that out and, and get into a little bit of a discussion with it. Um, uh, quickly on natural gas markets, and just to outline this for you to kind of outline why, why are we even looking at LNG? Um, we've had, a, as Jeff outlined, we've had a long history of, of uh, natural gas development in this province and in Western Canada. That marketplace for uh, much of our history up until about 2008, 2009 was a continental marketplace, okay? So unlike other resource commodities that are traded globally, natural gas was traded in a continental marketplace. All this changed fundamentally with the shale gas revolution. We mostly hear about shale oil, at least in the American context, and what's that, how that's transforming our economy. Shale gas is transforming and has transformed our economic situation here vis-a-vis -vis the other regional uh, natural gas marketplaces that are out there. And what's happened is since 2009 with uh, this massive explosion, and, and it literally is a revolution in the amount of supply and drilling and natural gas in the continental marketplace, we've got very, very low natural gas prices relative to historical norms and relative to other natural gas marketplaces. So um, what that means, uh, if we go on a go forward basis, these uh, lower prices are projected to hold up in the continental marketplace which means we're not going to get as much development of natural gas, our, our BC and Western Canadian natural gas resource. So what happens when, when marketplaces uh, have, have an opportunity? That opportunity is opened up because as Jeff outlined in both Europe and in Asia, natural gas prices are much higher. It does cost a lot of money to liquefy and transport natural gas, but those price differentials between the marketplaces allow for a potential emergence of, a, of an LNG market. So that's the market imperative. It's why we've got 12 uh, projects proposed for LNG development, five of which are by the super majors. So all of the major oil and gas companies are here looking at that. Uh, we do have a, a very robust and, and uh, I think world-class upstream environment. We're very familiar with all the technologies that are involved in, in uh, extracting natural gas. And I think the, the marketplace uh, considerations, uh, Catherine's I think outlined it. If, if the market's there and people are gonna invest, let's make that, uh, let's let them do that. I think from a, from a fiscal and a British Columbian perspective, Jeff's got a great chart there on the uh, fiscal, the royalty and rem, uh, revenue streams. I could outline a whole bunch more of the job numbers. But make no mistake, if, if we don't uh, get into the uh, export of natural gas into marketplaces that have higher prices, we are not going to be seeing the uh, revenue stream that has historically come from natural gas, and that includes the jobs. We will see um, some downstream benefits in, in our marketplace from having those uh, lower natural gas prices. There will be some substitution happening for oil products that, that are uh, trading at a much higher level, but it won't be in a significant scale. Now I'm going to cut right to where I think we should have a, a really rigorous discussion on, and that's the environmental imperative around LNG development. And Catherine said she hasn't taken a look at, at some of the scenarios and, and where things are, are going with, with energy development looking out. 
The good news is there's uh, a lot of data out there on this. I'm going to outline a, a couple uh, visions of the future that are pretty well established, I would argue, by a, a very, very credible organization. International Energy Agency, which does, I think, the best modeling in the world, very unbiased uh, modeling. Any scenario that they put forward uh, going forward, and this includes scenarios that have very, very heavy uh, uh, government regulation and pricing of carbon, all of those scenarios show a massive increase, a necessary increase in the use of natural gas. And it is simply, I'm gonna cut right to the chase. You, we simply have to bend the consumption of coal curve that is predicted in the developing world if we're gonna come anywhere close to meeting our climate change targets. It's why all those scenarios outline it. It's why it's fundamental to meeting the, the targets. You can't substitute, unfortunately, on mass scale over the next two decades, renewables to uh, meet that demand in where the demand is coming from. 80% of the natural gas demand on the go forward basis is gonna be coming from Asia. That's just the reality of the numbers. I, I don't know anybody who is arguing that those numbers are false. Um, so we need, to, we need to have gas to, to, uh, to bend the coal curve. I think the, the conversation then comes and I've got I've got some time for, for Catherine's concerns and our need for more life cycle analysis and, and uh, the kind of things that look a little bit more intensively about what LNG specifically means for BC. But here, here's why I'm a, uh, a lot more optimistic than Catherine is about our resource in a global context. Over 50% of the natural gas reserves in the world are held in four countries, Iran, Russia, Turkmenistan, and Qatar. And I don't know anybody who thinks that the uh, regulatory regimes and the regimes that they have around carbon pricing in those four regimes come even remotely close to what we have here in BC. We've got a carbon price here in BC. I agree we should have a robust discussion on how to use that money and, and what we could do with that in a much more effective way. But I would argue that our resource, our regulatory regimes, the things that we can do and should do to be leaders, and I'm quite proud to say that I was heavily involved in Premier Campbell's uh, uh, climate change plans just before I left office, I'd put that up against anything around the world. And I think we should be the market leaders. I think we can do LNG development better than anybody else or close to better than anybody else. And I think we should be having a much more rigorous discussion though uh, about that. But what I think we should avoid doing is naively thinking that if we can just shut down the LNG industry here in BC, that somehow we're gonna get a global benefit uh, from a GHG perspective. I fundamentally reject that. I've, I've yet to see anything that even remotely makes a, makes a case uh, for that. Catherine, the, 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 the substitution effect, uh, this conversation that, that you outlined, is, it, is, is natural gas gonna, gonna substitute for renewables in these marketplaces? There's nobody making that argument, nobody. That, that, that empirically I've read that's making that argument. So with that, I'd enjoy some questions and conversation and debate. And thanks again, Shauna. It's always good to be involved in these discussions. Great. Thank you. We, have, we have three great presentations, very diverse in terms of what they offer. Now, what we're going to do, I want to get a sense of how many people have questions already. OK, so we have a number already. What I'm going to ask, this is where we're going to make our, our panelists work. We're going to take three questions, so if you can write them down. Listen for the questions that you feel that you want to speak to most. You don't have to speak to all of them, but the three questions. So let's see hands again and go one, two, three for the first three. Um, thanks. I wanted to address the, the, the business case aspect because both Jeff and Tom are, are making the assumption that there's a huge potential market and there is that differential. Like right now, LNG is trading under $4 in North America per million BTU and like fifteen sixty-five dollars in Japan and China, more or less. But that's assuming that that's going to stay, that, that differential is going to stay. And I'm not sure if that's going to be a, a valid assumption. There's, there's uh, the Canada West Foundation put out a report last week saying there's going to be an oversupply. We're actually going to be delivering 269 billion cubic meters a year in supply to meet an additional 216 billion uh, cubic meters a year in demand. Uh, at the same time, countries like Japan are actively renegotiating their contracts so that LNG is not going to be tied to oil prices anymore because they don't want to be paying three times the, the North American price and markets just don't act like that. If, if, if there's a gap in the, in the price, it doesn't stay there forever. Um, and then also we've got new sources, like China is going to be starting fracking and generating huge supplies of their own uh, natural gas, as well as things like coal bed methane. So my question is, 
can we really make an assumption that that price differential of $12 is going to remain there forever and we're going to be able to make money on that? And if that inevitably declines, does the business case disappear? Hi, I'm Peter Wood with the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society. And uh, I just want to flag that we are being bombarded with requests for commenting on so many different projects these days, uh, from the pipelines themselves uh, to, to various projects that, that are around them, that we are actually overwhelmed. It's going very, very quickly, and we're quite alarmed. <coughs> One of the most alarming things recently is a proposal to build a pipeline through the Kutsumatine Grizzly Bear Sanctuary. Uh, near Prince Rupert, something which I, I felt was being pushed through uh, rather quickly. Uh, it's caught a lot of groups off guard. Um, we, we tend to hold protected areas fairly uh, sacredly here in BC, and uh, we were quite alarmed at even consideration of just opening up uh, as, as a precedent setting uh, uh, project to open up the Kutsumatine uh, as just one example. I'm wondering if uh, uh, CAP uh, has, has considered making some kind of commitment to uh, respecting protected areas and not putting any further protect, uh, uh, pressure on existing protected areas. Thanks. Um, my, my question was actually already asked, but I have a couple other. Uh, okay. Um, I was wondering if, uh, if someone could touch upon the uh, health implications of natural gas, specifically uh, H2S, and the effects on actually First Nations communities where, you know, people, the emergency standard is to tape up the doors and windows um, when there's a leakage. And in some communities, there's actually an emergency bus that's waiting outside the schools. Um, uh, that's, that would be my question. It's, it's not really related, but it's important. So price differential, protected strategies, and sure. health. Sure. Um, you want to go for price? Sure. I'd love to yeah. take price because I actually talked in uh, fairly extensively with Len Cote, who was the author of, of the report. It's a good report. I think it's interesting. I think fundamentally, though, the report does uh, point out that, yes, the there price differential will be there. Will it shrink? I think there's no question it'll shrink a little bit. It'll shrink simply because uh, continental prices are expected to rise, but they're rising very, very modestly would be the best description. The price differential is uh, going to hold up, but again, I'll go, go right back to Catherine's point. You know, the, the, the investment that's going to be deployed around that isn't going to be predicated on needing government subsidies or anything like that. It's going to be held held up by, by market uh, market forces. And if the price differential holds up, they'll deploy the capital and it's billions of dollars to build these facilities. They do need long-term contracts. And, and frankly, it is a, it's, it's a concern. I think the one thing that the, uh, we should be eyes wide open about, uh, and the report I think does a good job holding up, there is a lot of LNG uh, potential out there. Shale gas isn't just a revolution in North America. Shale gas and shale oil are, are all around the globe. And uh, you know the the other thing that the report points out is is the potential for uh, a vast network of pipelines coming from Central Asia. The the countries I outlined, or a few of the countries I outlined, that do have large natural gas reserves. So it I think what it underscores is it's a very competitive marketplace. But the demand side of it, um, that that huge demand coming from Asia for for energy products, is is where um, on a go forward basis uh, the estimates are that the price differential hold up enough to make uh, LNG viable on a commercial basis. I actually want to respond to Tom. Oh, there's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, you know, I've, I've read the IEA's um, reports, including the most recent one, which says that we, we could still achieve a two degree C scenario if we very um, urgently undertook a number of policies. And I agree that those scenarios show, um, you know, more than 80% of coal has to stay in, of thermal coal has to stay in the ground, two thirds of oil, um, you know, fairly robust greenhouse um, natural gas demand. We're not in that world. That's an increasingly desperate and hopeful scenario. If we're not in that world, we cannot assume that the, you know, the green, the natural gas is substituting for dirtier fuels. We could be in a 3.5 or 4 or 5 degree world, in which case we're just adding to the emissions. So I think we have to be careful which IEA scenarios we're pointing to and drawing conclusions from. <laughs> 
Um, I'll try and answer each one of those individually. Uh, I don't think anyone assumes that the price differential stays the way it is forever, uh, but that's the risk is on the proponent. So uh, the system that we have is the private sector takes that risk, and so uh, if it doesn't hold together, that's the investor's problem, not BC's problem. Uh, but no one's assuming that it won't uh, narrow. Uh, but there will always be, I agree with uh, Tom, there will always be a gap. Uh, I'm not aware of the uh, park. Is it a park that's being? Yes. And it's protected under what legislation, I guess, is what I'm trying to. Yeah, under the Parks Act. Okay. So if it's a Class A park, then uh, if it's not a permitted use for a pipeline, then that's the government's job to make that clear is what I would say. Uh, and um, the last one was the health, uh, the health study or the health uh, implications. So uh, H2S is obviously a, 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 a gas that is um, uh, quite frankly deadly, and so uh, you can't uh, live around it, obviously. And there are uh, uh, emergency procedures in place, regardless of what kind of community it is. Uh, if you're living near a place with H2S, uh, then there are uh, evacuation procedures if there is a release. So that's nothing out of the ordinary as far as I know. Thank you. Next three questions. Got one, two, and three. I'm going to come up, up there in a second. John, we'll go with Amy, John, and then Kat Carey. Hi. I was wondering where the development of natural gas in BC fits into the need to leave two-thirds or even 80% of all fossil fuels in the ground if we're going to avoid two degrees of climate change. We've got a budget of about 1,000 gigatons of carbon that we can burn. We've burned already half of that. So John, why are you sat here? You did have to choose the very top row. <laughs> Just to make, well, I'll give you some exercise. Uh, John Richards, I teach in the public policy program, and I have respect for these three people down there at the bottom, bright people, addressing uh, important issues. Um, I'm somewhat reluctant to pose it this way, but I don't see any way of avoiding it. British Columbia in the last decade tried to put itself forward as a pilot in seriously trying to change Canada's, potentially North America's strategy with respect to climate change. This was going to be the province which was going to set itself targets for greenhouse gas for emissions, was the first major jurisdiction in North America to adopt a credible carbon tax. I'm an economist by trade and I share their creed in the sense that <coughs> carbon pricing has got to be an element in meeting a two degree agenda if we're gonna make it. And that this has got to be a carbon tax which is in the order of 10 times larger than what we have in British Columbia at the moment. And to be very blunt, I put it to all of us in this room that we in BC are largely hypocrites. We liked that message in 2008, and we actually voted to sustain a government which was pursuing it. But then when it came to the 2013 election, the prospect for jobs, employment, government revenue meant that we entirely forgot about the lead role we were supposedly gonna play in trying to change international climate politics. Now, admittedly, it's overly ambitious for four million people to start thinking that they are gonna make a change. Point grade. There is forget. an element of hypocrisy in what we're doing. I'm interested in the response. Carrie, do you wanna just shout it out? Shout it out, okay. I'll pass over the mic. Um, I've got uh, actually a couple of questions, so, okay. Uh, the first one, the, I've got a question regarding royalties because we talk about the market case for this a, far, a fair amount and um, apparently in 2013 the royalties were $169 million to BC revenues and drilling credits grew by $161 million. So once you uh, put the royalty credits into the mix, we're, we're actually not talking about a pure market case for uh, LNG expansion. We're talking about a heavily subsidized case, and I don't know that we'll ever get to see it as a privately um, supported risk. It's a risk for everybody. Okay, three great, great uh, questions. Who's gonna start, Jeff? I guess I should go, I should take the royalty question. Um, yeah, so obviously you need to look at the context of the resources owned by the public, and so we do share in that risk. And so a royalty credit is not a subsidy. 
uh, royalty credit is an incentive, and I know that's a subtlety, uh, but it's an important one. Uh, the government and the people of British Columbia don't risk $5 billion a year to get the resource out of the ground, and so if the government looks at the people's resource in the ground that's not being brought to the surface and being able to so be sold, uh, they do what any landowner would do is, how can I incent someone to do something they don't necessarily want to do on their own? And so they share that risk. Uh, the government does get its royalty, but it gets it earlier than it might otherwise do. Uh, but the government puts up no money. Therefore, it's not a subsidy. Uh, it's an incentive. Uh, and so arguably, there would be less oil and gas activity if you didn't have that incentive, but there would also be less royalties. Uh, so that's a simple answer to that one, I think. Uh, may not satisfy you, but that's uh, that one. Um, probably comment uh, to uh, uh, John's, uh, John Richardson, uh, uh, comment about uh, uh, you perfectly described uh, Pilkey's iron law of, uh, of uh, climate policy. When it gets difficult, democracies vote. Uh, and that is a reality that we live in. We live in a small open economy uh, and we live in a democracy. And uh, at the end of the day, when it begins to be difficult and is a felt cost, people start acting differently. And so governments uh, can only be led by the people that elect them, and we have elected them to do so. Uh, and there was another, can't remember what the other one was, sorry. Amy's question? Right, uh, so I would look at that world demand for uh, energy and say, again, we're a small open economy. Uh, that demand is gonna be met. Uh, BC probably has a leadership role, and I believe we do, and we are doing that. Uh, but uh, we could turn off our spigots uh, and have no, no noticeable change in the economy, or uh, sorry, the w world emissions. Uh, we need to do that collectively. And so how do you do that? Well, you, you create a uh, jurisdiction where you're leading with climate change policy, but you're also taking some of that uh, money and in investing that as a, as an econ as a government uh, in uh, newer technologies. And so how do we take our wealth that we have today and transform that into uh, uh, future technologies, you need to develop some of what you have today to do that, to pay for that going forward. Um, the two-thirds fossil fuels in the ground, um, I didn't reread the IEA's latest report before I came today. It's, you know, sort of a later chapter and you could find that. Um, they, they do break down different fossil fuels and the biggest hit is for thermal coal, then oil. Um, and do show under that two degrees C scenario, fairly um, stable market for, for natural gas. Again, we're not in that scenario. We're in a um, emissions taking off scenario still. Um, John's question about BC as a leader, you know, absolutely, BC stuck its neck out there with, with the carbon tax. Um, I think our neck isn't out there and as vulnerable as it is often depicted in that, you know, we're finding now that emissions are declining. We're starting to have econometric studies on, you know, the agriculture sector, um, transporta tra transportation sector, showing that emissions are going down and that our economy is doing at least as well as other provinces. I think a big part of it, as you and I have discussed, is that we are recycling those carbon tax revenues through tax cuts, and I'm a big supporter of that, not um, directing that money to other things. Um, are we hypocrites? In some respects, yes, and in some respects, no. I think BC is hypocritical, you know, championing our climate leadership when um, in some recent years our number one export has been coal. Um, we just don't burn it at home. Um, and that we're considering expanding um, exports of thermal coal um, as the U.S. is reducing its emissions and has more thermal coal on its hands. They're trying to get that resource also to Asian markets and with proposals to do so through BC and we've seen significant increases of our thermal coal exports and that's the one that 80% has to stay in the ground to meet that two degree scenario. In other respects, I think British Columbians aren't hypocrites because they um, haven't had an oper the, the numbers, the, the choices haven't been put before them. We've been playing this, you know, there's this pretend game going on that, you know, we can have our 2020 targets and a trillion dollar prosperity fund as well um, without, you know, really talking about the choices we face um, in meeting our own targets. What do we want our role to be globally? Um, and I think British Columbians deserve to have that conversation before we conclude that we're hypocrites. Tom. So, it, as somebody who spent a lot of time with the, the 2007 energy plan that kind of 
start off the climate leadership piece. I get this question all the time. How on earth can you then go ahead and advocate for an LNG sector that's going to blow through the targets? And let's make no mistakes. If we do LNG development, we will blow through our legislative targets. There's, there's just no way around that. And my, my answer to that is this, and I, and I spoke to it briefly. If you look at the other options around the world for natural gas development, and if you look at what we should and can do with our policy set to enable it, on the climate change side, I will put our jurisdiction up, in theory, against anybody else. I think we can do it any, uh, better than anybody else. I think we should lead the way. I think we should, John, I think we should e evolve our climate leadership to also um, go into what is a, a new market opportunity. And I think it is, uh, I think it's imperative for us to do that. So, you know, the, the reconciliation in part, in my mind, is making sure that as we do this development that we're, we're leading the way in, in natural gas. Uh, development and it is going to require um, some changes to our legislative framework, and that's that's the reality of it. Um, we should be looking at it in a global context, and I think, again, what I'm happy to agree with with Catherine on is, is some of the conversation about the real numbers that are out there. We need to have them, and um, you know the government needs to put their policy framework out there that uh, shows that we can do this uh, development in a in a world class, global leading way. I, I think that's what we should be doing, and that's kind of my answer, Amy, to your question too. About well, should we should we should we just leave it in the ground? My answer would be we should do it better than anybody else, and that's on how royalties. we should lead. On royalties, did you want to add anything? Um, no, I think I think Jeff more or less covered it. it it's the incentive question ar around incenting the development of resources. I mean, it, it it's a challenge. It's a challenge intellectually to wrap your head around. You know. A, Giving those regimes and making sure the crown, uh, who owns the resource, still gets an uh, you know an adequate return, um, it, it gets a little bit complicated in in this particular marketplace just because continental gas prices are so low. Uh, but I'll perhaps leave it at that. We can take okay. some more questions. Other questions on the business case? One, two, and one last one. Any others? Okay. Uh, well, I, my question is on your Jeff slide, which was advocating for. Um, natural gas from the IEA, the golden age of gas scenario. My understanding is that that's a four to six C world uh, that they calculate. Four to six C. What's that? The that's golden the age of to, gas is four point. plus four C to plus six C. Say what that means. Uh, um, sorry, that means that if we follow the golden age of gas scenario that the IEA talks about, the world will warm by four to six degrees centigrade. And I believe the IEA termed that catastrophe in the World Bank. I can answer that immediately, that's not true. And the World Bank said that well, that should be avoided, 4C, for uh, golden age of gas. And uh, I just, that's, and I've also, um, along that line, Hansen said that, uh, and other people have said that we have to keep unconventional fossil fuels in the ground, and that includes fracked gas. Thank you. Uh, I just had two questions about the royalties, um, both from production and export, which we haven't talked about yet. Uh, I'm just curious, if we're producing more and more since 2009, why are the royalties going down? Is it more related to the price rather than the, okay. And the other part, I know provincial uh, policies for export tax are being announced in this month. So I was just wondering if you could give us a little bit of insight into what drives those and what a fair price might be. Uh, one more yeah, sorry, okay. One yeah. more question from the Twitter world. <coughs> So I have a question from Matt Darius Press, and the question is, what exactly does industry need from the government to grow? If the business case is so strong, why the PR push? <laughs> okay. uh, well, the short answer to that is uh, social license. I mean, at the end of the day, you can get a permit, but if society doesn't want you to go forward, uh, it makes it very difficult. And I think that uh, we have evolved uh, as a society to earning social license with your neighbor over the fence. Uh, to earning your social license in the entire jurisdiction that you operate in. So I think that's a sign of a healthy uh, democracy, so I think that's good. Um, uh, question, there was a question, oh, uh, about the royalties. Uh, they are price sensitive, so as price goes down, the percentage the crown takes uh, also goes down. So actually production in natural gas has actually leveled off in the last three or four years, uh, but it hasn't grown or shrunk substantially. But when the prices are high, 
the government takes a bigger percentage. Uh, the, uh, and uh, so uh, there is an imperative to find new markets. That market diversification is uh, fundamentally important because the North American market for natural gas is flooded and will be flooded for the foreseeable future, which means a low price environment. So uh, the business case for both my industry and the government is we need to find new markets. Uh, the LNG uh, tax piece is a good question. Uh, there is, uh, any time you talk about in, in uh, uh, putting in a new cost, there's always fears about competitiveness. Uh, and at the end of the day, you're competing with, uh, to put in perspective, Japan is about a third of the LNG market. They currently import uh, LNG from a dozen countries. None of them are in North America. Uh, our gas needs to be uh, price competitive and as reliable as those other places. And so uh, we're, you know, there is an important uh, public discussion around what is a fair price to get uh, for the government. And we're, there's, uh, there's no arguing that uh, the resource owner should have a fair price. Uh, getting that right, making it competitive is, is always a challenge. And I think there was one other question which I've forgotten. Which IEA, which IEA scenario was that? I honestly don't know. It's, it's hugely important. I Happy mean, is answer. it, you know, catastrophe or good news? Uh, it's both. I, I, I think it's, the, uh, I think the reality is, is there are several billion other people on this planet who are going to demand energy. How do we get that energy to them in the lowest carbon intensive way that we can? And natural gas is unambiguously a better solution than others. Catherine and then Tom and then we're going to come to a close. Okay. So. I, I think it does matter which scenario that is. Um, it, you know, and there's huge differences. I, I actually, uh, one comment and two questions. Um, I think social, social license will require a much more open and informed debate than we've been having. Um, the government isn't talking about the climate change aspects of this openly. It's great to hear you say, Tom, we're going to blow through our 2020 targets. I want to hear the environment minister and premier say that and what they're going to do about it. Um, a question for my colleagues on the other side, and that's that would you apply the same sort of global impact standard, global benefit standard, to oil and um, thermal coal exports from British Columbia as you would to um, natural gas? I can't speak to coal. I don't represent them. But oil, sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll quickly take a quick uh, uh, attempt to answer some of the, the questions. The IEA scenario, so the IEA does two major scenarios. They've got a 450 scenario, so that's you're familiar with that. And then they've got their NPS, which is kind of a, a baseline. But the, the golden age of gas applies to both. It's, it's, it's not predicated on either. Both of those scenarios have massive increases in natural gas uh, development. That's just, that's, that's the reality. Um, the, the, the LNG tax question, I don't really ha have much to add to it from Jeff. We'll see. I think it's going to take them maybe a little bit longer to, to get where they need to get with, with the tax. But uh, Jeff's right. They got to get it right. Um, the, the crown owner uh, deserves uh, a return and a, a significant return. And then it's overlaid with the competitiveness test, which is, you know, if you do too much, then you'll turn the tap off, investment goes elsewhere. So that's, that's the balance point that they're trying to do. The PR push, I think, is actually a good question. I think the social license uh, uh, kind of conversation is important to it. But why the push? Here's that there's lots of elements to making what effectively is a new sector um, uh, come to reality. So you've got the First Nations uh, component to that. You've got infrastructure and human capital needs that are fundamentally different to make this sector happen in a very skill-constrained environment. So there's a big push because all of the um, pay, uh, pieces, components, that investors need to make need to be happening right now. So why the push? Because before we'll get any investment, they need all of these things to be laid out. And that, and that includes the, um, the climate change and, and carbon aspects of it. So government's furiously working away uh, on, on all of this and hopefully we'll see more publicly soon. I want to thank each of you. I know that during the election, we were trying to do this kind of conversation. It was really hard to get answers to some of the questions that you've been asking. And we kept saying, wait until after the election. And this has been one of the better discussions that I've heard in terms of really getting some, some tough questions. And I know, however, I probably am walking away with more questions than I have uh, answers for. And, and I think that that's indicative of how important this issue, and, and as all of you have said,
uh, we need more discussion on this. So this is the beginning, I think, of a process. I think we've got some ways to go. But I want to say a personal thank you to Tom, Catherine, and Jeff, and on behalf of all of the organizers today for, for taking the time to be with us today. I also want to thank you for your questions. I think they were really good questions. And, uh, and I want to let you know that on uh, Thursday, November 28th, we're hosting our next Carbon Talks. We'll be looking at a vision for reducing BC transportation emissions. And Rob Abbott, the Executive Director of the Climate Change Secretariat for the BC government, will be with us. Um, we also want you uh, to take a look at what's coming out around transportation issues. We, we know there is a referendum in play. We don't know what it is, when it is. We don't know what the question is. Uh, but this will be a referendum re referring to funding for transportation in Metro Vancouver. So stay tuned for that. Uh, that is another initiative that the SFU Centre for Dialogue and Carbon Talks is watching closely. So again, thank you. Thank you to North Growth, PICS and the Centre for Dialogue, and to all of you and to our guests particularly. Take care.